Good morning. Good morning. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for the privilege of studying the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul and pray for your blessing this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our lesson this morning picks up at Iconium where Paul left when he uh, uh, left Antioch of Pisidia. You recall that it was there that he declared to the Jews after they refused to listen to him, he says, well, we're going to the Gentiles. And now he is arriving at Iconium when he gets there, a great multitude of both Jews and Gentiles. And by the way, when he said we go to the Gentiles, he really was talking about a special focus because Paul did not intend to ignore the Jews. Those are his own kinfolk and he had a great deal of interest in them. So many Jews and many Gentiles gathered, uh, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles against the brethren and uh, yet Paul and Barnabas continued to preach boldly in the name of Christ as a result many accepted the gospel God worked many signs through them and wonders and, and as a result of that uh, many others accepted the message of the gospel. But this increasing popularity angered the Jews. They were determined that they were going to do something about it, so they spread false reports about the apostles and raised up such an insurrection that the, uh, that the um, city managers were afraid that there was going to be uh, uh, the whole city would be in an in insurrection so they had got them together and the Jews made their charges but Paul and Silas presented very calmly and dig a dignified way the reasons why they were there and so forth and as a result the officers of the city could not see fit to uh, to do what the mob wanted them to do to get to get them out or to prevent them from preaching so it was that uh, there instead the officers recognized that if they were to accept the teachings, the apostles actually, they would be more virtuous, more law-abiding. There would be more moral and uh, moral order in the in the city. The next place they went was Lystra and Derby, where there were no synagogues and uh, not many Jews. As Paul presented Christ's work as a healer and uh, he was looking into the audience and he saw one man there who looked at him very intensely. And Paul realized as he looked at this man that this man had faith enough to be healed. And so he told him to stand upright and he did had never walked before, but now he's leaping and, and, and uh, enjoying his new freedom. And immediately the uh, people of the city who were idolaters uh, uh, concluded that these were gods that had come down to them. And so they cried out, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. They decided that Barnabas, since he was uh, a very venerable and dignified looking man who was probably the father of gods and Paul was Mercury who's uh, in the gods family, uh, echelon was known to be a chief speaker and very eloquent. 
it was very difficult for them to restrain the enthusiasm because these people put their convictions into action and they brought animal sacrifices and were going to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. And it was very difficult and only by their intense insistence telling them that they were representatives of the God of heaven who is above all gods and so forth and they finally restrained them. But the result was that uh, they were um, very disappointed. And in their disappointment, Jews had, had come from Antioch and, and uh, Iconium to stir up trouble, and they uh, led the same people who were ready to worship them, they led them to think that Paul and Barnabas were actually very bad criminals and worse than murderers and should be destroyed. So it was that their anger, or I, mean, I should say, their great uh, adulation and they're ready to worship them and now they're ready to, to stone them and to kill them. <coughs> So it was that they, um, this is the way it is with those who are following Satan. They're very quickly, their emotions can be quickly changed. And uh, in both cases, they were acting as heathen would act. And, and as a result of the stoning, Paul had assumed that he was going to be, that that was his end. He figured that was the last, that that, uh, that was his end. But the fact is, when he fell to the ground, they assumed he was already dead, and so they dragged him out of the city and left him there for dead. His followers, in spite of the uh, danger they faced in doing so, came and surrounded Paul they were mourning his loss, and all of a sudden he sat up, and then he stood up. They were so impressed by that, it, whether he was dead or not, I do not know, but it, at least as far as they were concerned, that was a miracle, and it is very possible that, that it was a resurrection, but at any rate, he was raised from unconsciousness, whether it was death or not, and suddenly uh, talked with them. And uh, as a result, uh, the people were greatly de uh, delighted and uh, were uh, loyal after that. Kind of left, got left behind in the, the uh, video. So as a result, there were many who were converted. And uh, Paul uh, set about to organize the churches wherever Paul went. One of the first things he did was to organize the new believers and to appoint leaders amongst them to help continue foster their their growth and to keep them united and uh, and for service this is a very important thing what we know about church order is largely known by reading the paul's epistles we find there Two things. Number one, uh, comments about what Paul did in organizing the church and his letters of instruction to Timothy and Titus and instructions about how they should relate to the church. So, but most of what we know of church organization is known through Paul's letters. 
one of the most important things for us today is to realize the importance of the church. It is God's organization for nurturing and for organizing and sending his people out to minister in his cause and to present the gospel. So that was at every place he went, Paul organized and appointed leadership. That leadership then became very sacred, a part of the church, and those who accepted the leadership and cooperated, the Holy Spirit could work with them. If they began opposing the leadership, the Holy Spirit could not uh, work with them. Ellen White says, Timothy constantly sought Paul's advice and counsel. He did not move from impulse, but he exercised consideration and calm thought. Now we found in our last lesson that Timothy joined them, and uh, so we now uh, have a threesome instead of twosome. It's Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. And Timothy was eager to be led and guided by the men of experience. And uh, the Holy Spirit found in him one who could be molded and fashioned as a temple for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Ellen White comments that the lessons that Timothy had learned were deeply embedded in his very character and that these lessons were practiced as he ministered with Paul and Barnabas. He had no special brilliant talents, but his work was valuable because he used his God-given abilities in the master's service. His knowledge of experimental piety distinguished him from other believers and gave him influence. Now the care of the churches rested upon Paul all through his life. Every time he gathered a group together and formed a church that became another special project for him to pray about and to come back to as soon as he could. Sorry, but um, what did you mean by experimental piety? All right, experimental piety, that's a good question. What is an experiment? Something to test something. It's something that you uh, that you uh, go through a process to understand. You test it, or you're trying to understand whatever it is. Experimental piety means piety that is not just a mental assent, but that we experiment with it, incorporate it in our lives, so that we we deliberately act according to what we're finding out of the principles. To experiment then would be as soon as we learn a truth, put it into practice. Thank you for raising that question. At any rate, uh, uh, Paul's burden for his churches was great and that's why we have so many letters in the New Testament is because we happen to have some of the letters that Paul wrote to encourage these churches. He would return as often as he could but but that would maybe every few years or so but in the meantime he would send letters to the churches and all most well virtually all of the writings of Paul are letters that he sent out. Now we have the book of Luke, of course, tells about Paul's ministry, but it was written by Luke, who uh, at this point is recording what he was told, uh, but in a short time we're going to find out he's going to say we instead of they. <laughs> in other words, to begin with, he's talking about Paul and Barnabas and others, but very soon he will join the group but he doesn't talk about himself 
The uh, reason we know he's there is because he changes the pronoun to we. Now, Timothy also took a burden for the churches, especially the small churches. He recognized that small, small churches had peculiar needs. Because of their smallness, they needed extra encouragement, and so they probably would not have the same degree of leadership. And uh, so he watched over those smaller churches and did what he could uh, for them. In all their missionary endeavors, Paul and Barnabas set Christ's example of willing service and earnest labor. They did not consult inclination or personal ease, but with prayerful anxiety and unceasing activity, they sowed the seeds of truth. They were always careful to provide instruction to the new believers that would help them to grow and help uh, uh, guard them against uh, uh, heresies and things of that kind. And especially people like Timothy, who showed a special promise, they took time uh, to train them. And it was a blessing for Timothy to be able to be associated with Paul and Barnabas. We learn more by doing than by hearing. And he was involved with them day by day. And that was the best training he could have. Trouble in Syria. Now, I, I referred to this a little bit ago. Oh, no, this is trouble in Syria, uh, Antioch of Syria. For a moment, I thought perhaps I was, had gotten ahead, and I was sure we had talked about it, Antioch and Pisidia last time, but for a moment I was thinking that was what we had here. But this is Antioch of Syria. When Paul and Barnabas returned to their mother church and the church that sent them out, they, of course, uh, gave a report of their work as soon as possible and told how the Lord had opened the door for them and, and all the, the things that had happened and how many people were joining themselves to the Christian church. It was uh, at Antioch, there was one of the largest churches and one of the most influential churches. And so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there. But during the time they were there, Jewish uh, believers from Jerusalem came as though they were sent by the church and insisted that the people, the Jewish believers, uh, 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 those who were um, Gentiles must be circumcised and, and adopt the, the ritual of the Jewish church. Now, they were so influential and so intense that even Peter... Uh, but that, that, that was a little bit later, though I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Eventually, Peter would become involved and, and uh, will be disaffected because of that. But at any rate, because of the confusion, the Church of Antioch said that we're going to send a delegation to the General Conference. That would be their General Conference. Uh, they were, it was called General Council, actually. But they sent a delegation to the, to the council. And there, Peter actually was a key to their defense. After they had... Um, let's see, we, where are we here? Uh, this is a discussion of the fact that the Jewish people... Uh, were slow to recognize God's plan for bringing in the Gentiles without 
becoming Jews. In other words, it was Christ. Everything, all those symbols that they had followed before were symbols of Christ. And now he's here. They don't need the symbols. We have him. They needed the symbols for several hundreds of years because that was the way for them to learn to understand what he was going to do, what he was uh, going to be and so forth. Now he is there. We don't need the moon shine when the sun shines. And only occasionally can you spot the moon in this daylight because the sun is so bright. And if you do spot it, once in a while you do, but it's very faint. And it doesn't add anything to your uh, visibility. On the other hand, when the sun goes down, it's wonderful to have a good moonlight. And sometimes, I remember in Alaska, the moon shone so brightly. One night my wife and I were together viewing it. You could see as far as your eye could reach to the hills and so forth, you could see it clearly. It was not the same as the broad daylight, but it's amazing what light there was. However, when the sun comes up, the, the, the lights of the heavens, the stars, and the moon disappear. Why? Because we have a brighter light. Now, if when there is a sun, you turn instead to try to find the moon and spend your time on that, that's not a very good, not a very profitable thing because you're ignoring that which gave the light to begin with. It's the sun that gives it light to the moon. However, the Jews were afraid, the Christian Jews were afraid there were so many Gentiles coming into the church that it wasn't very long before their own rights and their own patterns would be, uh, would be lost. And uh, of course they prided themselves on their, their uh, uh, services. That's what distinguished them from the, from the Gentiles, from the heathen. And they were happy for this distinction and wanted to maintain the wall of separation between themselves and uh, the Gentiles, which gave them a sense of being special to God. Now, they were appointed as a special, peculiar people, but they rejected Christ. Now, for them to continue to demand the ceremonies was an affront to Christ. It was actually rejection of Christ. Paul, earlier on, had said that he himself, according to the law, was blameless. He, he kept it completely. But now he has a clearer understanding of the law and he recognizes that all of the law is simply symbolic. And as he realizes that when you relate to the symbol as reality, it becomes a formalism. You think you are gaining life. You think you're gaining salvation through symbols. Symbols only point to what is real. And according to Hebrews, there was no one was ever justified by the symbols. They were justified by the reality, and it was only after Christ came, it was on the basis of his coming and his death, that all the former people like Abraham and Moses and David, all of them were saved on the same basis. And the symbols, the rituals, only provided a means for them in their minds to understand what was going to happen for them. Now when Paul uh, was teaching that the ceremony of uh, circumcision was nothing and that whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised makes no difference with God, he was not doing away with the Ten Commandments. 
because the ritual system had nothing to do with the moral law. The moral law was there to guide and direct all mankind for all time. It wasn't just a temporary thing, it was permanent. And so Paul continued to uphold the Ten Commandment law. And now is the time when bitter controversy uh, causes them to send the delegates to uh, Washington, D.C., <laughs> to Jerusalem, <laughs> to, their, to their headquarters at the time, Jerusalem. And it was while they were disputing in the Jerusalem council that Peter stood up and testified and told the story of how he was at Joppa and was, had gone up on the roof to, to uh, meditate while waiting for food. It was time, just about time to eat. And while he was there, he went into a trance and he saw a sheet let down from heaven that was full of animals, all kinds of, of creatures and uh, unclean beasts and so forth. And he heard a voice saying, Paul, rise, slay, I mean Peter, slay and eat. And he said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is unclean. And uh, the sheet was taken up into heaven and came down again three times. And every one of those times, the same voice, same command, and same response. Now, why three times, do you suppose? If this had happened only once, he might have thought, well, I just, my stomach was bothering me and I, I had a strange dream. But the same dream came three times, the same command. What is the significance of three in Scripture? Well, actually, the three is based on, on the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the three was a number uh, which would confirm. In other words, if it happened once, well, who knows what caused. Twice, well, that's unusual, but three times would conv convince Peter that this is definitely something that he needs to be paying attention to. And then it was that God explained to Peter that he should not call any man common or unclean. It was at that very time that the voice spoke to him, it's Peter, he said, go down, there's some men from, from uh, uh, can't even say the name right now, but anyway, they've come to invite you to, to, uh, to Cornelius. Uh, has sent them. And you go with them and don't doubt anything. Now why would God say nothing doubting? Because Paul was a good Jew and the Jews had no personal relations with Gentiles. They did not have any uh, meals together you know, there was nothing of, of a personal nature, and God's now wanting to warn Peter. If I said Paul in between you, forgive me. Uh, we're still talking about Peter. Peter, you go with them and don't doubt anything. When he got there, because, and by the way, when he left to go to Cornelius, he deliberately invited several men to go with him as witnesses because he knew that this could very well become a, a, a bone of real contention in the church for him to, to uh, go with these uh, soldiers uh, into the home of Cornelius. When they got there, the Holy Spirit was poured out. First of all, Peter told the Cornelius to begin with, he says, you know, <coughs> you know the pattern 
of Jewish people. And this is unusual for me to, 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 to be involved in this way. But the Lord had shown him he must do that. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. The same Spirit that was poured out upon the apostles in the latter rain is now poured out upon them. And Peter says, what, what can prevent us from, from baptizing them? So he did go ahead. And now he's testifying of this experience and is assuring the people that by this dream and by Cornelius' dream and their coming together in his home and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, there could be no doubt that God plans for the Gentiles to receive Christ without becoming Jews, without being circumcised and without uh, uh, participating with, in the law. So it was in this way that God made it clear that he was no respecter of persons, that anyone who listened to the gospel and accepted it would be received without having to go through some special form or ceremony. When Paul and Barnabas went back to Antioch, they didn't go alone. And by the way, they had some other uh, uh, Antioch Antiochians <laughs> with them to begin with. But their group was enlarged as they went back because the uh, report that they were to give the Gentile, that is the Jerusalem Council was determined that they would not be the only ones to testify that they would have some of their key men who would also testify with them. And by the way, this slide has to do with their acceptance, and I, I missed that. The, um, the fact is that James, let's notice the latter part, James says, Wherefore my sentence is that you trouble not them which among the Gentiles are turned unto God. So we're back at the council now, it's closing, and James speaks for the council, but also he declares the Holy Ghost says, and so forth. So it was, they were assured that the Holy Spirit was speaking to them that they were not to uh, require that the um, uh, Gentiles be circumcised. Now we're coming back, as they come back, they come back with Judas and Silas, two of the key men from Jerusalem who were also prophets. And as they came, they gathered the people together, and not only did Peter share the results, but the whole Pardon me, Peter also comes with them and they share the results of this vote. Now notice they did not all have to vote. I mean, not all the Jews came together. Not all the Christians came to, to vote. They were on the basis of a representative government. Now that is the kind of government God has given us. God's church plan is not democratic. It's representative. And you, you know the difference clearly, do you, between democratic and representative? Actually, American government is not democratic. We talk about democracy, but democracy has to do with every person voting. We're all, all involved. And if, uh, if our American government was, gov uh, was democratically true, truly democratic, we'd never be able to operate because everyone would have to have their say, and there's too many. But this is a representative. Americans have a representative government in which we vote and we secure individuals to go to represent us. And your congressmen are our representatives. Uh, you have the right to speak to the Congress 
uh, to the uh, to your congressional leaders, send the messages, email or phone or whatever, but they're the ones that speak for for you. And the New Testament times, God's church followed that same plan. Indeed, um, when the American government was formed, it was the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, that led to the kind of government to, to develop that would work and that would be uh, representative of everyone, but not require that everyone be directly involved. So the church was representative. Our church today is representative. There is never a time when all of the church gets together to make decisions for the denomination. Now, in the local church, we have a, a somewhat different because it's a smaller group, and that is we have church business meetings. And in a business meeting, every person in the church has a right responsibility to come and become involved. Not everyone does, but everyone has that opportunity to become involved in the decision making. Supposing, uh, for instance, right now for the last two or three years, the Colfax Church has been considering whether to remodel and enlarge their church or to build or to buy some other property. All of the members are involved in that, everyone. And if they're not there, they're at least sent reports so they can, uh, they can speak to the officers or whatever it is. But anyway, in that case, it's a small enough unit so everyone can be involved. But a large church like Antioch would be too large for that. And furthermore, we're not talking about Antioch, we're talking about the whole church, because whatever is done in Antioch must be according to principles of God's church, the whole church. So, the, uh, Peter comes with them, Paul and Silas come with him, and they testify to the church of what God's plan was. And this was a great comfort and strength. It tended to solidify the work there in Antioch. And from the first, the church has had many obstacles to meet, and it ever will till the close of time. Satan will constantly be raising problems. Every place Paul went, he faced trials and difficulties. And not only was he beaten, till he was unconscious. But the fact is that he was involved in shipwreck and all kinds of different problems during his lifetime. The cause of God prospered. The Antioch church was favored with the presence of Judas and Silas, the special messengers who returned with the apostles from the meeting of Jerusalem. Being prophets also themselves, Judas and Silas exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. These godly men tarried in Antioch for a time. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, and many others also. But at this time, I mean somewhat later, the Jews who rejected this, and, and by the way, the church today is not much different than it is then. Not everyone accepted the general council uh, decision. And those who did not came from Jerusalem to Antioch and appeared to be speaking for the Jerusalem church, the headquarters church and insisted that they must be circumcised. Now they were speaking on their own, but they're deceptive, making it look like they are there to speak for the, uh, for the church. And uh, <clears throat> during that period of time, the conflict became very great. And it became great enough so that 
Peter himself was carried away. Peter uh, decided it might be better for him not to eat with the Gentiles anymore because of his influence and so forth. He was afraid that he would lose his influence. The fact is that Paul confronted him publicly and uh, he said, Peter, you know, how's it happened? You're rebuilding what has been taken away now. And uh, Peter is an example of a certain kind of people, and there are many, who will compromise thinking it's the best for the truth. But still, they are compromising their own basic principles. It was Peter who stood up and said, the Lord has shown us by this that we should make no difference. The Lord is no respecter of church, church uh, people, and the Gentiles who come to the truth can receive Christ directly just the same as the Jews. They do not need to be circumcised. And yet, Peter now apparently sides with the, the uh, people from Jerusalem who are falsely bearing witness, and he now withdraws. And Peter's influence was such that Barnabas felt that, that he must do the same. So now you have two key leaders that are unfaithful to their own divinely uh, directed convictions. But Paul decided it's time to have a public uh, dealing with this. And so in public, Paul pointed out Peter and said, Peter, you're in the wrong. Why are you doing what you are? Now, one of the most important things about Peter is that he did accept the correction. Peter could have be, become an insurrectionist. He could have risen up against Paul and had two main parties fighting each other. That happens oftentimes in God's church. But Peter recognized he was in the wrong. He accepted the rebuke. And instead of this splitting the church, it actually tended to heal the church because now Peter and Barnabas both uh, follow the plan of the Jerusalem council and they're free to, why, why should they not eat with the Gentiles? The very refusal to eat with the Gentiles is saying that they are unclean and they're not really accepted, they're not truly Christian. So they resumed their former relationship and God was able to bless them. Now, you ask, how does it happen that Peter, who had all kinds of blessings, he was with Christ for three and a half years, he heard his teaching, he was with Christ when, uh, when they went to um, the borders of, of Tyre and Sidon, so that Christ could help them. You know, he healed the daughter of the Syrophoenician lady. And first of all, he pretended for a few minutes uh, to ignore the disciples who were pushing her away. But he did not push her away. He instead uh, uh, healed her daughter. But he was there with Christ continually. And then he had this vision and Caesarea, uh, uh, Cornelius had had his vision, and now there's a double evidence, and then the Holy Spirit being poured out, you'd think this man would never betray the cause, but he did. And this was after his conversion. Certainly, the experience of Peter in this case demonstrates that the papal claim to Peter's uh, uh, is completely false, that he is the head of all the church and, and the infallibility claims and so forth. Peter had to be rebuked by Christ as a disciple, has to be re rebuked by Paul now as an apostle. And so <clears throat> it was that the work of God was established even in spite of the insurrection. In fact, these 
uh, conflicts actually were essential as a means of making the transition a transition that was very difficult because even some of the new converts believed that they should be convert, uh, circumcised. They reasoned the same as the Jews, that God gave circumcision as a requirement, and he gave certain rituals, and for 1,500 years these rituals had been carried out under God's direction. Now he's not likely to change them, is he? The fact is that they were never given for permanent. They were given until the seed should come, until Christ should arrive. And so it was that Peter had every reason to, uh, to avoid what he did. But human beings are weak. And Peter did not know what motives drove him. But a key motive was not simply to keep the unity of the church, but to keep the relationship of Peter, because he was afraid that people would, would uh, that he would lose his influence with the church. And so there was a, a pride that had to be overcome. Now, do leaders have pride? Do leaders have to, to, to die to pride daily? If they don't, they're in trouble because we all have the same natural disposition and everyone is proud by nature and must daily. That's what Jesus says, take up your cross daily. What is our cross? A denial of self, a willingness to die to in our own opinions, our own ambitions, and so forth. At the close, the comment of Ellen White has to do with the fact that every man needs to have a realization of his own helplessness. And that means the key leaders as well as the followers. Because no one can act independently of the Holy Spirit and succeed. And no one knows exactly what he might do if he's not under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Paul was often compelled to stand alone. Not very many people are able to perceive when they have to stand and when they have to let things go because both are important. God himself knows when a thing is essential and the Holy Spirit knows and can guide us. Now later on we're going to see that Paul did something that seems to be contrary to his principles but was not. It was following out other principles that the same God had given and the Holy Spirit was directing him. So Paul often had to stand when the rest of the church and his leadership were sometimes confused. But the one thing about it, it says here a little later that Paul had no strained views of his own importance he did not, he did recognize the importance of the church and was constantly subject to the church even though he must rebuke one of the leaders of the church. That did not mean that he was putting himself against the church. But throughout his ministry, he recognized the importance of the church and the importance of organizing the local uh, communions. Here's the statement, notwithstanding being personally taught by God, Paul had no strained ideas of individual responsibility. In other words, there were times when he had to stand, but this did not give him the sense that he had the right or responsibility to controlling the rest of the church. 
He looked to God for direct guidance, but was ever ready to recognize the authority vested in the body of believers united in church fellowship. He felt the need of counsel, and when matters of importance arose, he was glad to lay these before the church and to unite with his brethren in seeking God for wisdom to make the right decision. When they sent the delegation to Jerusalem, of course, Paul was with them. That was a matter of his own submission to the church. And it, after Peter made his appeal, Paul then made his appeal. And it was as a result of Peter's appeal and Paul's appeal that the decision was made. <clears throat> but but uh, the but scripture says even the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And this is in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, for uh, Paul then was ready to challenge if necessary, but always as one who is also subject. Priesthood of believers requires that we be subject one to another. And that is, all of us have to be subject one to another. Does that mean there are no leaders? No. It just means that we are in a, a submissive attitude toward each other. We listen to each other. We follow the principles that, are, uh, that others may present. We are seeking unity, but never at the, con, uh, never at the um, cost uh, of, uh, of sacrificing our convictions. But we do everything we can to um, protect the unity of the church. And we'll see that in Paul's actions in a moment. So Paul and Silas were dealing now with another uh, missionary journey in which they went out throughout the whole of Syria and of Cilicia, st uh, strengthening the churches. At Lystra, Paul was to see how believers were to endure the test of trial. He was not disappointed because they were loyal in spite of violent opposition. The impression of Timothy's, Timothy, Timothy's mind seemed Paul stoned and rising again and continued to go right on preaching made a deep impression on his mind. And when Paul came back again to strengthen the church and the churches of Lystra and Derby. It was at that time that Timothy asked Paul if he could join the team. And it was here that Timothy uh, became a part of the missionary journey. Paul and Timothy were very close, and it was as a result of Paul's ministry that Timothy became a strong leader in the church. But now, what about Timothy? Timothy's mother was a what? A Jew. As a Jew, what was her responsibility? Well, it always had been circumcision of the child. But the father is a Gentile, and the mother has not circumcised Timothy because his father was not in favor of that. Now, let's stop for a moment and consider what is the issue of God with Jews. They had been circumcised. Now, when the G Gentiles are no longer to be become converts to the Jewish faith and don't have to be circumcised, did that change the situation with the Jews? Well, it did, but it didn't. They're in a different category. 
the Jews, God saw fit to allow them time to transfer their thinking. In other words, God did not suddenly tell the Jewish people, you cannot be circumcised anymore. You must not observe the laws. But Paul taught that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not. However, the Jewish people as a whole still were following the ritual law. And it was, they were not forbidden to follow, the Jewish Christians were not forbidden to follow Jewish law. They had no more reason why they needed to, but they were not forbidden to. And Paul decided through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Timothy should be circumcised. Why? Because it was necessary to be circumcised? No, because Timothy was going to go with him every place he went. And because of the intensity of convictions and feelings of the Jews, it was better for him, whose mother was a Jew, to go ahead and be circumcised rather than to be in constant confrontation and problems with those who, uh, who realized that Timothy wasn't circumcised. And so Paul advised Timothy to be circumcised. Now that seems like it's a contradiction and it might seem to be a compromise. In reality, Paul was doing what we all must do. Conform as completely as possible to those that we must disagree with. Disagree with them only where it's necessary. And in the case of Timothy, it was not the same issue as it was uh, with other Genti with Gentiles. Because G uh, Timothy was not only a Jew, but was raised by his mother and grandmother and had been trained carefully in all of the scriptures and so forth. So Paul was impressed by the Holy Spirit to have him circumcised so that they would not have unnecessary confusion and problems over that. Paul wisely advised Timothy to be circumcised in order to remove from the minds of the Jews that which might be an objection to Timothy's ministration. In his work, Paul was to journey from city to city in many lands and often he would have opportunity to preach Christ in Jewish synagogues as well as in other places of assembly. If it should be known that one of his companions of labor was uncircumcised, his work might be greatly hindered by prejudice and bigotry of the Jews. Everywhere the apostle met determined opposition and severe persecution. He desired to bring to his Jewish brethren as well as the Gentiles a knowledge of the gospel. And therefore, he sought as far as was consistent with the faith to remove every pretext of opposition. Yet while he conceded this much to Jewish prejudice, he believed and taught circumcision or uncircumcision to be of nothing and the gospel of Christ to be everything. Now, as Paul continues preaching, he goes through Galatia. And we're going now to review some of the instruction that Paul gives later on in the book we call Galatians, in the letter of Galatia. Uh, and so, by the hearing of faith, they received it the uh, Spirit of God and became the children of God by faith in Christ. Paul's manner of life among the Galatians was such that he could afterwards say, I beseech you, be as I am. His lips had been touched with a coal from off the altar. He was enabled to rise above bodily infirmities and to present Jesus 
as the sinner's only hope. Those who heard him knew that he had been with Jesus. His very countenance, his, his, uh, the Holy Spirit's presence with him was felt. Endued with power from on high, he was able to compare spiritual things with spiritual and to tear down strongholds of Satan. Hearts were broken by his presentation of the love of God as revealed in the sacrifice of his only begotten son. Many were led to inquire, inquire, what must I do to be saved? Paul's method of presenting the gospel, he always kept before them the cross. That was the central focus. Everything that he taught had to do with Christ and him crucified. His focus on Christ was not just general. Every place he went, he talked about his time in Gethsemane, about the capture by the mob, about the trial before Herod and before Pilate and Herod and then back to Pilate again, before Annas and Caiaphas, and then the uh, rejection of the Jewish nation, his blood be upon us, our children, and the cross. So the cross was the central focus of all his preaching. <clears throat> For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Christ came to reveal the Father and Jesus was a faithful revealer of God so that in his very countenance and his face you could see the glory of God. If those who today are teaching the word of God would uplift the cross of Jesus higher and still higher their ministry would be far more successful. If sinners can be led to give one earnest look at the cross if they can obtain a full view of the crucified Savior, they will realize the depths of God's compassion and the own sinfulness, the sinfulness of sin. Without the cross, man could have no union with the Father. On it depends our every hope. From it shines the light of the Savior's love and when at the foot of the cross the sinner looks up to the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with fullness of joy, for his sins are pardoned. Kneeling at the faith, this is important, notice this carefully, kneeling in faith at the cross, he has reached the highest place to which man can attain. Where is the highest place man can attain? kneeling at the cross which means adoration which means submission it means that we accept Christ as our righteousness instead of our own and Paul says that I may not have my own righteousness but the righteousness of Christ shall we bow our heads thank you Lord for your many blessings thank you for Jesus Thank you for the cross which he suffered, which reveals more than anything else the character of love that you have for us, the willingness to sacrifice, to suffer, that we might be saved from our sins. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to reveal and that in our own faces may be revealed the glory of Christ and the Father. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.